This is our second annual Innovation in the College of Public Service Symposium. Now, innovation because these folks here, these professors here, are just indicative of the various innovative things, research that, and projects, service projects, that we do in this college. And uh, so we decided, we actually, Dr. Van Horn, uh, thought it would be a really good idea to get everyone together and rather than just simply writing, this is what I've done, this is what I've learned, let's talk about it and engage in an exchange of ideas. So they could present what they've learned and you might be able to ask some questions about the process, how they came to their conclusions, what did they learn from it, what were, they were they surprised about anything? Well, how does it, how does what they're, how did what they do, how does what they did affect their teaching? All those kinds of questions that you might want to ask, I'm sure they're going to want to share. So we have no particular order. We're going to, I'll, I'll just tap somebody on the shoulder and say go. I didn't, that wasn't, that was just a, uh, okay. that was, that wasn't the real thing. So, um, so we're going to just go through and, and, you know, go through, we'll share, feel free to ask questions as the professors are sharing their work. That's what we want. We really want this to be an informal conversation. So feel free to do that. Feel free to go back, get some food, get some water, and we'll start. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. I do want you to know that you're not looking at just any professors. These professors were awarded the opportunity to do this. So in other words, they had to fill out, they had to come up with an idea, they had to fill out a proposal, and then they did the project. So that's the kind of environment we have in this college. Uh, they, are ac they have actually learned from each other in previous presentations, and that sparked new ideas. That's the kind of place that I think you like to work in, and you were a part of all of that. Some of you have given us ideas, and we will do those things. And so to have you here with us tonight in such numbers is incredibly exciting because it, it shows that all of us honor people who innovate. Innovate for better practice. And we're all about that in the College of Public Service. So I just wanted to say welcome and wanted to make sure that you understand these are award-winning faculty. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for reminding me about that because yeah. I want to add on to that, that not only is it is a process, they have to apply for the award and then they are reviewed. They're reviewed yeah. by their peers. So, the, and there are some, not every application makes it. So it is a competitive process and they are the award winners for this past year. So I am going to start randomly. Let's see, who should I pick? Hmm. Yeah, he knows, he's got that smile on his face. Dr. Allaire. Um, I, guess th I guess it is kind of appropriate that I get started because um, I, I'm a member of the committee, I'm the chair of the committee that actually helps to evaluate the applications for the curricular and scholarly innovation uh, awards. Dr. Gehring is also on the committee, so I want to recognize her and her service uh, to everybody. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> See, this is good. It takes up my time speaking about myself. Um, but what I really enjoy... I'm so sorry, I forgot to do this. I am about to pass out uh, one sheet summaries of their research for you to look at and take home after, the, um, after they do their speaking on their research. So just so that you know that. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Volano. Um, so what I really enjoy, uh, just very briefly uh, talking about the committee, uh, I really enjoy the opportunity to review, um, to, to be a part of this committee because it's exciting to see the things that um, faculty in the College of Public Service come up with. Uh, we all get so busy with teaching and with the research that we're doing and with all the service that we have to do that we don't really get a chance to talk about some of the really great projects and the really great ideas and the really great conferences that, that we want to go to. Um, so this is a really nice opportunity for uh, myself and the other members of the committee to really dive in and, and get a sense of uh, what's happening in the college and what people are doing in the classroom. So um, it's, it's gratifying and it's amazing to see all the cool things that are happening and that some of which you're going to hear about tonight. Um, so my portion of the program tonight, um, I was asked to speak about 
the UHD NASA partnership that, uh, that has been developing. And um, so to, to back things up, in I think it was, and, and Lee, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was May 2017, um, we were approached by President Munoz, who happens to be a close personal friend of astronaut Joseph Acaba. Um, and Joe Acaba was going to be going up to the International Space Station, and it just so happens that Joe also used to be a math and science teacher. So NASA was having a year of education on station, and they wanted to find a way to coordinate with the um, Department of Urban Education, specifically science methods, which uh, I, I teach, uh, to work with, uh, potentially work with Joe up on the space station um, and interact with him in some way. Um, so we, we, had a, the, we had a meeting of the Brain Trust, and we came up with some, some ideas. And um, so, so there were really three phases to, to the partnership uh, that, that school year. Um, one was in class. So students in science methods, and this was the, the elementary, the four through eight, as well as the graduate courses, uh, developed uh, science projects, developed science experiments that they performed here on Earth and that we had hoped, that was the plan at least, that Joe would perform up on the International Space Station and we would be able to compare the results and he would be able to give them feedback about the experimental and inquiry process. Um, another facet of the partnership was uh, having a K-12 through open house here at UHD um, because even though NASA is only, N NASA Johnson Space Center is only an hour away, it's very difficult for a lot of students in our partner districts to get down to NASA Johnson Space Center to, to participate in things there. So we decided to bring NASA to downtown Houston. And so NASA's team of uh, uh, educational specialists uh, came to UHD. We had an open house for uh, K through 12 students, as well as for uh, UHD students, which was amazing. Um, we were we were going to do it again this year, except we had a, a little thing called a government shutdown, um, and because NASA is a government agency, they were also shut down. Um, at least the non-essential people were were out of uh, the office during that time. Um, the third piece of the puzzle was a downlink a live downlink between Joe Acaba up on the International Space Station and students here at UHD. Um, and this was a really special honor for UHD because uh, NASA will only select somewhere in the ballpark of 35 or so schools or organizations to do a downlink with any particular astronaut on the International Space Station. So the fact that the president was a college roommate with the astronaut really helped. That, that, was, that was key. A and it kind of fast-tracked us into it. Um, and, uh, but it was just so awesome. It was like the best Skype call I had ever had, um, getting to talk with an astronaut. And so we had students asking great questions to Joe Acaba up on the space station. Um, Joe had a great time. Our students had a great time. And um, so it was, a, it was an amazing, amazing year. And, um, and so funds from the Curricular Innovation Award were used specifically for the purchase of materials to use to develop the experiments in the classroom. But um, what's really cool is that since then, we've continued with the NASA UHD partnership. Um, we're, we're still trying to figure out what it's going to look like because sometimes things depend on funding and right now I'm the only full-time science person in the department, so that makes things difficult too. Um, but We've had uh, NASA educational specialists come to our classrooms to do, to do demonstrations for our pre-service teachers. Uh, we are looking at a couple of different projects, perhaps for next year. Um, one is to, uh, do, to, to really integrate NASA curriculum into the science methods classes and then hook up students with really all the materials they need to do those lessons for their student teaching and in-service teaching uh, as a way to get activities like STEM on station into the classroom, um, but then also to make our students, especially the elementary students, feel really comfortable and confident doing science. And um, we're looking at scholarship opportunities, we're looking at internship opportunities for UHD students. Um, so it's, it's really exciting, and uh, I enjoy all of the time that I get to spend with, with the NASA folks. I mean, they, they have an amazing job 
And uh, I'm, I'm in awe constantly when I get to go down to Johnson Space Center and, and hang out with them. And, and they come up here too, and um, they love meeting with our students, they love interacting with our students, um, because they, they want to, uh, to help us create fantastic teachers that are going to do good science in, in the classroom. Did I talk too long? Okay. That's so wrong. Okay. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Goins, and I'm just so excited to see all my students here. Thank y'all for coming out. Okay. So the extra credit helped, right? <laughs> um, I want to thank Dean Van Horn because this was her brainchild. This was her baby, and I actually had the honor of presenting at the first one last year, and I, I, I commend her vision for this because as faculty, we get professional development money, and uh, we can use that for professional development conferences, but every now and then, you know, a conference outside of that may come up where we're just burning to get our research out there, and we need the funds to do that. And so uh, Lee came up with the idea of having the Curricular Innovative Award and also a Scholarly Innovative Award. And uh, both of these have been so helpful. And I've received one of each. And so I can uh, testify to the fact how helpful it is. And I also want to thank Steve Filano for always doing such a good job on putting this together. So thank you, Steve. So <laughs> thank you. So punch me when I'm at 10 minutes. OK. So uh, the project that I wanted to tell you about uh, that I used my Scholarly Innovative Award for was for a manuscript that I wrote actually when I was in my doctoral program. So I was actually a student when I wrote this paper. So I just want to let the students know something that you do, even on a bachelor's level, if you keep working on that and work it into a manuscript, you could be published even before you go to grad school if you work hard enough or if you, you go on into your doctoral program. And so I kept working with this project. I actually taught the aging course here several times before I did this actual project. Uh, I was in practice for 20 something years and I worked with older adults who had dementia. And um, when I taught this class before, I didn't have a service le learning component to it. Uh, where I had students go into to different placements and, and uh, get that experience working with an older adult. And I said, well, what if I added that to what my students are already doing in the aging class? Would that increase their knowledge and their skills and their ability to work with an older adult with dementia? So um, I got approval to add service learning to my aging course for the first time in 2017. And so I went through the Institutional Review Board here at U of HD to get approval to collect data from that class. And so this manuscript that I wrote is based on that data that I gathered. And um, some of the findings of the manuscript I have listed on the, uh, the intake there. But again, when I got it to the point that I needed to present for peer review, uh, I needed some money. So uh, that's about the time <laughs> that the Scholarly Innovative Award came along and uh, my manuscript got accepted for presentation at an international conference in Dublin, Ireland, which is really exciting because I, when I tell you, you know, that I was a student, of a, doc, a doctoral student at the time, to have something accepted, your research is accepted to present in another country, I didn't, I was like, wow, I didn't think anything, anybody was interested in what I had to say in America, but they accepted my proposal and I said, well, I need money to go to Europe, and I applied for this grant and I got it. But just some highlights of, of, of the study, I found out that there was a significant increase from pre-test pre to post-test of students ranking themselves when they went. They, they showed an increase in their knowledge of working with an older adult than they did before they started uh, doing the service learning hours. And so this was very exciting uh, to be able to show not just that uh, our students are doing great things working with older adults in the community, but also that our university is doing research that's presented at an international conference. And so um, I learned a lot of things through this experience. I learned that um, you present your research and you get peer feedback. Um, it was constructive, uh, good and bad. The only bad thing I think somebody said was that uh, they couldn't wrap their brain around um, how I was able to get, I guess, the students to work with this population with, their, uh, with older adults having dementia. But a lot of agencies here in town, I use Sheltering Arms and I use Gathering Place, they love our students when they go there. And so um, 
they didn't even have to, they didn't have to sign a waiver or anything like that. They took our student up as volunteers. But one of the ladies at the conference just wanted to know, well, how would you do that? How would you get that approval? And I said, well, you, that's where you create those community partnerships. And so I talk to Sheltering Arms every year, and like I said, they love having our students. And so that was some feedback I was able to incorporate into my manuscript, is that that's something that we need to do to increase the likelihood that students would want to someday maybe work with this population. And taking this class kind of gives them that experience to do so. And so, um, but it's also interesting for students that, that that your practice can translate into research. So everybody who's going out into a particular discipline, whether you're urban ed or criminal justice or social work, if you think there's a great innovative idea that you have and you can do a study on it, one day you may be presenting at a conference somewhere. And so I just wanna let the students know that, you know, I never dreamed that that was possible, but anything that you, you know, something that might be something off the beaten path to you may be very, very interesting to someone else. And it also informs the literature because there's not a lot of, and that's one of the reasons I did this study, there's not a lot of research out there in literature on working with older adults with dementia. And so providing stu students that opportunity to do that was very exciting. And these students um, were very excited about signing the consent form to do this study because I said, one day your name, you know, your de-identified name will be in light when this gets published. <laughs> Because, you know, you can't put their names out there. But uh, so, and that's my plan once it gets uh, published, and I'm about to send it off to a journal that, that I'm going to get a hold of those students and just let them know. It was those students for that class that made it possible. And so, um, that's it. Hi, I'm Dr. Jacqueline Sack in the Department of Urban Education. And... I, is this working? <laughs> I am, the, the award that I received was to be able to continue to co-teach a course for secondary teachers, which is taught in the math department, um, geometry for secondary teachers. And as part of the grant, we also wanted to get, get kind of a feedback from some of the students who were in the class. So the course is designed to be very interactive, learner-centered, lots of activities that they engage in where they construct things and then they come to conclusions, not unlike a science lab, but very unlike traditional math instruction. And the reason we do this for those who are taking this course for people who want to become secondary math teachers is to have them experience what it can be as opposed to the very traditional approaches for teaching and learning math. And so, so the, we, we worked with six volunteer students and we had, we had two um, clinical interviews with each of them to, right at the beginning of the course, in the middle, and then we had focus group meetings with them right at the end to get a good sense of where they were coming from. So they right at the beginning, it was clear that they were used to sitting in class, taking notes, going home, doing problems, coming back, repeat, repeat, repeat. And then when they began to take our course and everything that we did with them was very, very interactive where they had to construct things and make sense of what they were doing, very collaborative, very different approach to what they were used to and they really liked it. So. Dr. Kwander and I had a kind of a, a process. We would always debrief after each session to plan anything that we wanted to change for the next one. But sometimes she would walk around while I was kind of coordinating things and she would notice something that we didn't expect and she would come up to me and whisper in my ear and then we would make an instant change. So it was very interesting that our students we, we weren't explicit about what we were doing and one of them said we thought that you hadn't planned very well <laughs> you know and here you were planning in front of us <laughs> and once I explained that really that is what happens when you are a real teacher and you pay attention to what's going on in front of you you do have to make in the moment changes and they really appreciated that so they loved it they loved the collaboration they loved the hands-on activities. I hope that they will go on to use those. And 
I guess one of the big pluses, two big pluses came out of this. One of them was that several of them chose to come and get their teaching credentials through the U Urban Ed program, where they hadn't thought to do that before. And also, we got a really nice publication out of this, which I was very pleased about, you know, to talk about our, our hands-on inquiry-based project and what we had done with the students. So we've also been able to present aspects of this at international conferences, and it was nice. There you go. Very proud of it and hoping to continue to do this, even though I don't have funding to do the co-teaching, I'm going to continue to do that because I think it's important. Can you tell us a little bit more about the actual, the actual hands-on part of your project? What was different about the approach that you were doing? Okay, so I, I, th this has taken years and years and years of development. It's, you know, I use what's called the design research um, protocol where you try out something and if you see if it works or it doesn't work, you change it the next time you do it. And it's evolved over years. And I've used many of these activities in my methods courses, my math methods courses for elementary and middle grades. But this one is designed to continue on into the high school level, which is a bit more abstract in some ways. Um, so a lot of the activities, instead of just giving um, some image of some geometric figure. They have to construct it themselves, not using traditional compass and straight edge, but using um, hamburger patty paper, you know, where they trace and they, they, different ways to construct things that are much more intuitive. My students here, I think, can attest to that. And, and through that, because they have constructed things from literally a blank sheet of paper, they're able to make sense of properties that emerge because of that. And then we, we have, I have some theoretical um, I, perspectives that kind of help them make sense of where they're going with this. So it's, it's, it's pretty well grounded in, in, good base, in, in good geometry research. I asked Dr. Sack to go into a little bit more about that because I had the privilege of working with Dr. Sack when she took part of that program to a community center, uh, the Leonel Castillo Community Center right up the street here. And the, 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 the students that she worked with, they were basically elementary students. What, I, I am not good at math. I am not good at math, or that kind of math anyway. But the concepts just came up out of the, they, they became concrete. And that, to me, was the magic of it. That through her research and through her ability to apply it, the students just naturally got it. And you know, I don't know, I don't know about you, but sometimes you're stuck in a, in a, at least in a math class, and you're like, no matter how well the teacher is explaining it, it's just going right over my head, because I just, I don't get it, because I can't see it. Her work helped uh, the students to see it. And just FYI, that particular project that I took to the community center was the result of, I think, about eight or nine years of working with a third grade teacher with elementary students, helping them develop 3D visualization. And you've written a book about it. Yeah, that's been published and presented all over the place. Thank you, Dr. Sack. Thank you. So before we move on to the uh, other professors, does, does anyone have any question about the work that Dr. Allaire was doing with NASA? Any questions you might want to ask him? He doesn't have the astronaut's phone number, so I'm just letting you know that. But uh -huh. uh, can I join your class? Absolutely. Oh, there you go. How about, how about Dr. Goins? Does anyone have any, any questions about Dr. Goins' work and her process? I think it was pretty exciting to learn that even as students, you can get involved and you can even get published. That, to me, is very exciting, even though I'm not a student. OK, and we seem to have forgotten Dr. Buckler. So you know what? I want you to go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Share. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so for my project, um, it was a CARES Award. Uh, can't remember exact. Conference and research experience for students. There you go. That's what it stands for. Um, and the really cool thing about uh, the award with regard to my story here is 
Um, I need to thank the dean as well. Um, the CARES Award originated because of me coming to uh, Dean Van Horn and saying, I need some money. Um, it, it, was, it, was a fun, it was a funny thing. We, we had created this, this, this program of awards, and one of them was linking us to the university in terms of getting money for students to travel. And I guess I was the first case to bring, bring to you, and uh, we ran into a little snafu uh, when I applied with the university. We were informed that because Brandon Andrews, the student that was working with me, was not part of a student organization uh, on campus, he was ineligible for the funds. So I came back and I talked to, to Dean Van Horn and she was like, okay, we're going to create a new program and we called it CARES. So thank you for caring. Um, uh, that, was, that was, yes, you see what I did there? Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> I worked with a, an undergraduate student named Brandon Andrews. Uh, Brandon came to me and said, I'm really interested in either going to law school or uh, possibly going to graduate school. And so is there anything that you have going that I could be a part of? So we talked for a while and we kind of agreed that uh, we would do this study of the Texas legislature uh, in terms of how they I guess process through uh, cr uh, bills related to crime and justice and criminal procedure and things of that nature. Um, so it kind of started that way. You know, I said, you know, you're interested in law school. This would be a really good thing to 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 do. Uh, he talked a little bit about his interest in politics. He told me things about politics that I didn't know. Um, so it was it was kind of a match made in heaven there. And we basically collected data from um, the Texas legislature website over a 12-year period, which is six legislative sessions. Um, and one of the fabulous things about this was Brandon, I think, learned from me, but I also learned from Brandon. Um, you know, Brandon had recently gone through um, courses here at UHD that taught him how to use Excel and all of the wonderful things that Excel can do. And I had spent a career doing things in SPSS. And I remember at one point, Brandon kind of looked at me and said, Dr. Buckler, this would be much easier to do in Excel and then transfer it over to SPSS. Now, I was a little hesitant at first, you know, old guy, you know, <laughs> learning new things. But I let Brandon take over, and sure enough, Brandon saved us so much time. I, I told him, I said, I would have spent hours doing what you just, we just accomplished in 10 minutes. So Brandon actually taught me a lot about Excel that I continue to use. Um, Excel, fabulous, fabulous functions relative to uh, SPSS in some regards. Um, so we collected this data, and it was basically looking at questions like, does it matter um, the, if there's going to be a loss or a gain from the, the, the bill uh, in terms of bringing money in or losing money? And you know, the legislature, before they get to a point where they're looking to pass something, they do a fiscal analysis, and they print out this nice little sheet that says, our fiscal analysis suggests that this is going to cost an additional X amount of dollars um, uh, for how many year period, um, or there, you're, you're going to see gains of this amount. Um, so we collected that type of information. Is it going to create a loss or a gain? We collected information on the types of organizations that come to Austin to either oppose or support the legislation. Um, we did that by looking at agenda sheets for legislative hearings that take place. Anytime uh, the bill starts to advance, the House will do a public hearing. Then it, if it gets to the Senate, they'll do a public hearing, and people will come and express themselves. So there's witness lists, and we did a lot of counting in terms of the number of organizations that are coming to support or oppose, the number of individuals who are coming to support or oppose uh, the standing of those um, organizations. Um, in 
Texas, there's two major organizations that play in terms of crime, crime bills. Um, that's the Texas Public Policy Foundation. It's kind of a more conservative organization. And the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition, which is a little bit more of a liberal or progressive slant. Um, so we, we collected that type of information. We collected data on um, the subject of the bill. You know, is the, is the bill related to creating a new law that has a new, new penalties? Uh, what type of crime is at issue? Is it property crime? Is it violent crime? So on and so forth. And we basically created this data set um, where we, you know, basically conducted our study using this data set. Um, I mentioned earlier how much Brandon taught me about Excel. Um, there was another moment I'd like to share about uh, Brandon. Um, at one point, you know, we, we had thousands of bills, it seemed like, and we wanted to get it down to a sample. So I knew in my head what I wanted to do. I wanted to kind of stratify the sample by year and uh, the type, I, th the stage that the bill had advanced to. But I never really said, Brandon, we're going to use stratified random sampling here. We just started talking about what we needed to do. And in the process of doing it, Brandon had this light bulb go off where he said, Dr. Buckler, this is that stratified random sampling stuff that I learned in my methods class, right? I said, yes, Brandon, that's exactly what it is. So it prompted this uh, discussion about why we were doing stratified random sampling compared to other sampling strategies that are out there. Um, so that was a really nice, um, nice you know, point in, in terms of working with Brandon. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed every moment of this. We, we would spend hours in one of the conference rooms going through these bills, collecting data. It was a really good positive experience for me and I think Brandon as well. Um, what else to say? It, it, it was just all around a, a good experience. Um, and let me, say, let me say this as well. Another thing that I took from this, um, it, this helped me understand that I needed to do something a little different in my research methods courses. When, when Brandon said, this is that stratified random sampling, right? I said, and I said, yes, and I was taken aback by that. Uh, so what I did was I took that kind of applied thing that was going on. He, was, he, he knew what that, what that was when he started doing hands-on applied using it. So um, in future courses, what I've, what I've done is I've created a project where students have to um, come up with a research question and they have to identify about a data set that I give them to, to work from. Um, and then they have to use that research question to say which sampling strategy is most appropriate here. And then they have to actually execute it and come up with a sample of a larger population. And it's that portion of it has been really successful so far. And I, I think that uh, students have learned from that through me learning from uh, what Brandon was experiencing in that moment of doing applied hands-on research. And I think that's about it. Thank you, Dr. Buckley. Question. Yes, ma'am. Question. You know, Dr. Barstow, can you repeat the question for the? <clears throat> yeah. So basically, the question is about the funding issue. Is it passed more if it's going to create a loss, uh, or is it not passed if it's going to create a loss, and vice versa? Um, it was a. It was really scattered, to be honest with you. Uh, one of the interesting things that we found is that if any bill relates to cracking down on sex offenders, like registry-related stuff. It didn't matter how much it was spent it, that was going to be spent. It was passing. <laughs> it was advancing through the stage. So it was a little. We found that it was a little bit more complex than what our original research question had asked. It wasn't just about is it, it if there's going to be a loss, it doesn't pass. If there's going to be a gain come in, it's going to pass. It was a little bit more complex than that, and had a lot of ideology going. Um, um, the, it was a very issue based. 
to, to a large extent. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Any other questions? That's okay. <laughs> 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 um, could the results of the data that you collected be reutilized in a secondary data analysis of your topic? And if so, what is, what is that topic? Um, I think so. I mean, um, I've kind of made a career out of using secondary data. So uh, someone who comes behind me, you know, there's there's the possibility of making something else out of the data. Um, and, you know, when, when, we, when we looked at the state, our dependent variable, our outcome was basically the stage at which the bill progressed to. There's seven stages, you know, filing it is one stage, uh, it advancing to the origination chamber committee and getting out of the, that committee is the second stage. Third stage is going to the origination chamber full house and getting through that and just kind of up through the, the chain with seven being uh, bills that are filed by um, or bills that are signed into law. Um, and one of the things that I think you can do potentially secondary data on, analysis on that we haven't really touched on that much would be um, the bills that advance all the way up through both chambers pass through but are vetoed by the governor. Um, that seems to be a really open area of research. Um, I looked, scratched the surface on that, um, and there was a few patterns that I was able to identify, but I think that's something that can be done with, you know, this secondary data set. And there's your student to do it with. There's my student yeah. to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But, but funded because there was a sense of urgency around the issue. Right. So, wow. Yeah. It's and neat how your questions actually provoke people to think into deeper research. As, as I listen, I'm, I'm thinking it's, it's like a circle with arrows, and you can start somewhere, and it's always going to lead back. So maybe you start in the classroom with an experience with students and the questions, and it leads you to collect data, to present at a conference, to write a paper. Or you can mm -hmm. start with a research question that you present at a conference, write a paper, and you realize you've discovered something amazing that you need to feed back into the classroom. Right. So it's, it's completely neat. And what it really means is that you're a big part of it. You're doing it with them. Nice. So what, one of the things that I love about this kind of doing this symposium is that you see the breadth of work that the, the, our college is involved with from outer space to uh, prisons to, um, to suicide prevention in India. That's just a, a small sample to the criminal justice system. That's all just within this college. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of various, very varied work in, in this college. So I'm going to pass the microphone to... Professor Savani, uh, and you can start. Thank you. So hi, everybody. I'm Shana Savani, and I am really excited to be here. Um, uh, so I am a lecturer at the College of Public Service in the Social Work Department. And for me, this, um, you know, the grants that uh, Dean Van Horn has created, you know, the Curriculum Innovation Award, the Scholarly Innovation Award, and the CARES Grant, and a number of other grants that I have access to as a lecturer um, is just really, really significant because as a lecturer, uh, because I'm not a tenure track faculty, I don't have access to the university level grants. And our college, the College of Public Service, is the only college on campus that has all these grants that can be accessed by lecturers. So people like me can do some valuable work here uh, that other colleges on campus cannot do. And again, you know, I, I really applaud uh, Dean Van Horn's leadership on this 
to make this awards, uh, make these awards available to us so that we can do all of these, um, you know, incredible things, you know, myself and other lecturers in the College of Public Service. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Dean Van Horn. <laughs> This could never have been possible. I could not have done 10% of what I have done last year uh, if it were not for these awards. So um, I got four awards last year, and three out of the four awards were related to promoting uh, suicide prevention and intervention um, at bachelor's level social work programs. So, uh, you know, just a, a little snapshot on uh, the status of suicide in the United States and in the world. Suicide in the United States is the 10th leading cause of death um, in the US. And it is the second leading cause of death for younger people in the entire world, um, uh, globally. Um, about 50,000 people in our country die by suicide every single year. Uh, about 1.5 million people make suicide attempts and a suicide uh, intervention or you know care for people who have attempted suicide costs this country 67 million dollars a year so we are talking about a problem that in its enorm it's enormous in its magnitude you know this is this is a huge problem uh, particularly for social workers, you know, if we look at uh, some of the some of the literature that's uh, relevant to social workers and dealing with those that have experienced suicidal thoughts or are um, you know demonstrating suicidal behaviors, we know that most people, most people who have mental health issues, come in contact with a social worker. 65% of mental health services are performed by social workers in the United States. And 93% of social workers report that they have encountered a person who is suicidal. Yet, yet, there are very, very, very few bachelor's level and social, uh, bachelor's level and master's level social work programs that actually teach about suicide prevention and intervention. Very, very few. So just a scan in um, you know, uh, schools of social work in Texas, I think we are the only program at the bachelor's level that has a course on suicide prevention and intervention. Uh, so you know, the, the whole point of uh, you know, writing all these grants that I wrote last year and working on this particular project was to introduce a suicide education at bachelor's level social work programs so that our social workers are better, are better prepared when they get out in the field to deal with people who have serious mental health issues, particularly who are suicidal. Okay? So with, um, you know, with the generosity of this college, um, Dean Van Horn, and the monies that I was awarded, um, there were there were like two major outcomes, and I'll tell you about the outcome first, and then the process later. <laughs> uh, the The first outcome was that we were able to uh, develop a, a new course on understanding suicide. And this course was developed for social work majors and non-social work majors. One of the courses that was offered was in a hybrid format, and one was completely online through Zoom, through synchronous Zoom. Um, and 40 students last year took this course, you know, because there were two sections offered, and some of them are sitting right here. Um, um, and, and, and to me, that was like very significant that we were able to do that. The second outcome was that we were able to develop a study abroad um, in India uh, focused on mental health and suicide prevention in India. Now, again, if you look at you know, statistics on suicide globally, 75% of all suicides happen in the developing countries of the world. Okay? 
Um, and uh, a major part of uh, that statistic of the 75% happens in Asia. So Asia is one continent where most suicides happen. 60% of suicides that happen globally happen in Asia. So India was, uh, you know, uh, 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 an important sort of venue to study about suicide prevention and intervention. If we were going to do anything in, a uh, in Asia, uh, it would have to be, you know, in India or China. And so because I have lived in India before, this was a, a feasible thing for me to think about and to do. Um, so with the monies that I received, um, I went to present at a conference. Um, this was the International Conference of Suicide uh, Prevention uh, in New Zealand. And I made all these fabulous connections, you know, professional connections, and was able to develop an entire study abroad focused on suicide prevention and mental health in India. So currently, we have... Um, uh, you know, professional relations with a number of agencies in India, in several cities in India, uh, that do mental health and suicide prevention work. Uh, and we were able to take students last year, 16 of us went to India and we visited all of these places. Uh, and hopefully this year, again, we're doing the study abroad. Uh, last year we did it in only one city, this year we're going to do it in four cities because, um, you know, again, from the monies that I was awarded, I was able to visit these other cities in India last year after uh, we finished the study abroad program and develop uh, further connections with suicide prevention and mental health agencies in other cities in India. So, um, so yes, so that's everything that we did. And students, uh, some students that are here came to India with me, and some students that are here are going to come with me in December this year. So, thank you. Questions? Questions about this project? Any, yes, ma'am. Just more out well, in the study abroad it's only in India. Okay. Are you are you I don't know how are you okay. Are you wanting to or thinking about actually bringing uh, having being able to work with agencies here because I know we have a big need. Yeah. Um, just about two weeks ago one of my best friends, her her sister tried to commit suicide and it's been hard, so every Every um, training and anything that I come to and they speak about it, I'm always like, how is your sister? Mm -hmm. So it's something that, you know, it's common and it's happening so much, but we fail to see the signs. So I think what you're doing is great because it's helping bridge those gaps. So thank you. Thank you. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so my question is, is if you see an increase in suicide increasing throughout the years, do you think it's social media that has this impact? Is it a certain age group, or is it older people, or a younger generation? So, uh, suicide as a phenomenon. So, suicide as a phenomenon is very complex. And a lot of times, we tend to sort of simplify it uh, as, uh, you know, he was having financial issues, that is why he did it. Or she was having marital problems, that's why she did it. Or this happened, or that happened. We tend to sort of sing, uh, simplify it into, um, you know, one thing or things like that. But, uh, but suicide is, um, you know, first of all, suicide is a outcome, right? It's not an illness in itself. It is an outcome of several intersecting factors. These factors can be biological, they can be social, they can be psychological, they can be, uh, you know, all kinds of factors. So you mentioned social media. Social media can be one factor, but it cannot be the only factor. Uh, for younger people, uh, particularly, you know, you have a 
sort of a construct called contagion, suicide contagion, where when one high profile suicide happens and it is broadcasted everywhere over social media, you tend to see um, a lot of other young people also do the same. You know, and that is a very much studied phenomena. It is called contagion, uh, but social media again um, has is only one factor in that. Um, you know, in even in the contagion factor, social media plays one small part. There are many, many other moving parts to why somebody decides to take their own life. If that makes sense, yeah. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Are you offering the class uh, again for yes. students who are not social workers? <laughs> yes, maybe? so it's open, it's open, uh, but if you register, please make sure to register in the right class. There is one class for social work majors, and there is one class for non-social work majors, and registration is open for both classes. A uh, really quick question. So you said that we do not have a lot of masters and like a bachelor's um, workers that help out with suicide. So why is that? Um, of course, this is a very big like a uh, problem. Of course, between like teens and like you know like young adults. So why is it that we don't have more help for these uh, like uh, for these people? Um. Uh. You know, there are several factors um, that play out why we do not focus on suicide education at the bachelor's or at the master's level. Um, I think that, um, you know, one of the things is that there is not enough training, um, you know, that is provided. So if I haven't been trained on suicide prevention or suicide intervention, um, and, and I'm faculty somewhere, what can, I, what can I do for my students, right? Because historically, uh, bachelor level and master's level progra programs have not dealt with suicide education. They have not offered suicide prevention and intervention education to their students. So students coming out of their program are ill-trained, right? Um, also, I, I believe that um, faculty sometimes uh, don't know how to, how to deal with this, you know, uh, unless you have gone through, um, you know, very specific training around this issue, it is very hard to teach about it. It is very hard to prepare the next generation of social workers for this issue. If you yourself haven't been trained enough. Does that make sense? Um, the other thing, it's just very challenging to do it. You know, so when we, um, you know, decided that we would have these two new courses on suicide prevention and intervention, a lot of my colleagues who do suicide prevention work and who are clinicians, uh, raised some very serious ethical considerations. You know, if you're going to teach about suicide in an online format, how are you going to monitor students? What if somebody becomes suicidal? What are you going to do? How are you going to monitor? So there's a series of ethical uh, sort of considerations that are raised the minute you talk about teaching suicide online you know, in an online format. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, factors that revolve around why this subject has not received uh, enough attention in, in, in uh, social work programs around the country. I think also it's, it's interesting to note that Dr. So Professor Savani is, is someone who had his, has an interest and has already made an impact. She wasn't waiting for someone else to do it, she recognized the need, and she took her expertise and created something. And that's what you all can do with, with what you're receiving in your education. It, it doesn't have to, you don't have to follow on someone else who's done something before. You recognize a need, and you follow through on that need, which is what Dr. Savani has done and is continuing to do. Yes, ma'am. OK, so it's like more of a statement and then a question. Um, I feel like it's easier to digest suicide whenever you can simplify it. And, but whenever you do that, 
because I used to do that, to be honest with you, and I've been in, went to the study abroad and her suicide classes as well. And um, I thought I knew what I was talking about until I actually got into the class and was like, oh, wow. Like, what I was <laughs> saying and how I thought I was helping, necess like, that was not the right approach at all. Um, and then also, <laughs> How do we get into this on the graduate level with U of H? Because it says that we can, at the Graduate College of Social Work, that we can do the study abroad program again. <laughs> so, um, so thank you, Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea went with me to India last year, and of course, wants to go again, right? <laughs> So what happened last year was that, um, uh, I think that's my phone, <laughs> it's okay, uh, I'll speak louder. So what happened last year is that when we uh, developed the study abroad and we went to India, there was a professor from the Graduate College of Social Work, Dr. Gehring, who has an interest in suicide research, who went with us. And the reason that he went with us was that he wanted to bring his students to India next year on this particular study abroad. Um, and so this year, Dr. Gehring, Dr. Robin Gehring at the Graduate College of Social Work uh, has introduced this as a study abroad for graduate level students. So some of the our students are coming with us this year and some of our students are going this year. So we will be a group of about 30 students. That's as much as we can handle. Um, uh, but it will be a mix of um, uh, graduate students and bachelor level students. And so I think the interactions will be very stimulating. So Chelsea, just to answer your question, I had to give this whole spiel about why this is even a question. So Chelsea, your best bet would be to contact Dr. Gehring at the Graduate College of Social Work. Yeah. All right, thank you. I am going to pass the microphone to Dr. Kelly, who will tell us about his project with the Juvenile Detention Center right down the road. Right. Two blocks from here. Uh, good evening. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Dean Van Horn and Stephen for the nice grant that they uh, granted me uh, to continue my, pro my project. Put it closer to your mouth. Uh, there? Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Usually my voice carries a lot, but I'm not standing up. Um, I'm a, a professor at, uh, in urban education, and I teach special education. Um, I'm also uh, responsible for the certification program for special education. Uh, <clears throat> I've been here since 2010, which is nine years, and I have been doing a service learning project that whole time nine years. Uh, all of my students, all 130 of them generally during the semester, have to do a special, I mean a service learning project. It's part of the learning process. What I found is, is that students uh, that came into the class that uh, had, never, had never really been around anyone who had a disability. I'd say 90% of them had never, had never been up close or personal with someone who has a disability. And so, um, and special education tends to be very abstract, even though it's an education uh, approach. Um, it has its own vocabulary, acronyms, it's got its own way of doing things. And so, um, I found that my students uh, were having difficulty. You can read and write about it all day long, but until you are with someone and um, help serve them, uh, you don't really understand exactly what they're going through. And so um, I decided to start offering a service learning project. All 130 of my students have to go to a community organization outside uh, in Harris County, preferably, and they volunteer with an organization that serves uh, services or provides services for individuals with disabilities. There's 13 of them in, in IDEA, uh, which is um, the governing body, but so there's plenty of, there's, there's an organization in Harris County that actually provides those services. So, um, and so what I was trying to do is connect the content to uh, what is going on in real life. And uh, it's very difficult to do. So um, it, uh, then out of that, um, I became interested in um, 
uh, the juvenile detention center. And so I got uh, involved with them. And I, I call that my Star Trek project uh, because I take my students someplace no one ever, they have never been before and no one else has ever been before. And until you've been inside a, um, the a juvenile detention center, you don't, you don't quite understand, because it's not a, uh, this is a non-traditional educational setting. And most of my students um, um, go in there scared to death and they come out, they, they come out um, actually uh, mature individuals. They actually mature in front of my eyes. And one of the uh, things that uh, happened, we uh, morphed in, uh, over the years from uh, just going in and helping the teachers uh, to um, actually teaching literacy inside the juvenile detention center. A few years ago, um, the principal came to me and he says, John, I've got to have a, I have to have a reading program. I just don't have anything that's worked. Uh, can you help me? And so uh, another professor and I, who was also part of the project, um, got together and we uh, put together a, a reading program uh, that um, has turned out to be very successful. And it was so successful that um, we were asked by one of uh, uh, the sister organizations, uh, JJAP, which is Juvenile Justice Alternative Education Program. Uh, they contract with 23 school districts in Harris County. I didn't realize there was there 23 in, in Harris County. Um, and they asked us to bring the same project into, um, into the JJAP. The difference between the Juvenile Detention Center and the JJAP is the Juvenile Detention Center is incarcerated youth. These are kids from 10 to 17 who have done, uh, they've committed a crime that was very egregious and they can't go home. Because generally they, they, want to, they, they want those kids to go home the day that they're, they're arrested. Um, and they try to get them to do that. But sometimes parents say, you got them, you keep them. And uh, it's very sad. It's a very difficult environment. Uh, J, the JJEP, they go home every day and they come to school the next morning, so there, that's the difference. I was awarded a grant, I uh, was running out of books, actually, textbooks. We don't use textbooks, we use, um, um, uh, what do they call the, um, hmm? graphic, novels. graphic novels, thank you. Um, so we used a graphic novel approach, and that's what we came up with, and it was, uh, we had one, one book, uh, that we, well, we had, multiple books for everybody, but we had, uh, we were, uh, it was called The uh, Invention of Hugo Cabret, which I didn't think they would ever agree to because one, it's about that thick, and it's a hard, a, a hard copy, and it's basically, a, it could be a weapon. And then it was about a individual who is sort of a juvenile delinquent, and I thought, well, they're not gonna go for that, and they loved the book, and the kids loved the book. And in fact, they loved, loved it so much, some of them had read it two or three times, and they finally said, and this is how I knew we were getting being successful, is the kids came to me and said, can you get us another book? I've read this book three times and watched the movie several times, because it, it has a movie to it. And I said, oh, okay, this is great. So I went out, contacted Steve, and we picked another. We, they have to pick the book. The, the juvenile detention center a, a system has to pick the book. And so we came up with the, uh, the same author wrote a book called Wonderstruck, and it's made, been made into a movie, which is a very important piece of the learning process, is that we have a graphic novel and we have a movie. And so it, it, it uh, goes together really well. So, and that was great. Well, the same problem came up. And so this thing has morphed to where the teachers now in the juvenile detention center have gone out and gotten their own grants and gotten more graphic novels, and it's uh, it's mushroomed. It's not a very it's a very difficult process. It takes about four weeks to uh, to get my my students into the juvenile detention center because they have to be 21 and they have to pass a FBI background check, which is the ultimate background check. So you. It takes about three weeks to go through the entire process. So uh, once I have 130 students, and all of my students are invited to come in, but not everyone can make the 7.30 a.m. Uh, 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 roll call. So uh, 
Uh, so uh, I get about about a 10% generally, about 14 students that are uh, actually can go through the process and are successful at uh, going there. So it's been a, a very rewarding. Uh, anyway, uh, Steve, I went to Steve. I said, I got to have some money. I, I don't. I run out of money. I run out of book. You know, and um, I'm trying to build a library is what I'm trying to do, which I have because there's about. 300 in, in juvenile detention center and another 100 at JJEP, so there's about 400. And they're expensive books. They could run around $16. I went to him and said, can, do we have any money? Do you have any money? Can I get some money? And so he uh, sat down and we uh, mapped out a, a, a um, prep uh, to prepare ourselves for. Um, uh, so we got, oh, I don't know how many books, but we got a bunch of books. And so we were able to set up uh, enough books for the JJEP and for the Juvenile Detention Center. Um, so anyway, it's been a very uh, interesting um, uh, program and project. Um, I keep wanting to say no, I'm not going to do it anymore. But uh, most of my students go, come into my class now uh, wanting to know when are we going to go to the Juvenile Detention Center. So the word is getting out and people are going. I have used the, uh, the data. Um, uh, to, um, to develop uh, numerous uh, articles uh, that have been published. Uh, I've also uh, presented in uh, uh, internationally and nationally, uh, nationally and internationally, uh, primarily in and around Spain. I've co uh, uh, um, worked with, uh, and through my uh, research in my papers, I've uh, worked with uh, individuals in, in China in Spain, in England, uh, Africa, uh, other countries, um, Australia. So uh, others have found my work and, um, and from my pr uh, presentations at the, at the conferences that I go to. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Mitchell, Laura Mitchell, is uh, I've invited. She's actually a bilingual literacy, and, um, but she's been a wonderful uh, uh, person to work with and she's taken and she's taken time out of her own time and her own projects and her own service learning projects to uh, help me uh, work with the and continue the the um, success of the literacy project and uh, Dr. Uh, Bernardo Pohl has also uh, participated and uh, we've they've been part of the publishing and the research and everything else that we've been doing so it's been a wonderful experience um, I don't foresee that uh, I guess I'll probably go to my grave, you know, trying to get more books. <laughs> so that's my biggest problem. Oh, I would like to say is one of the major contributors to uh, early on was uh, uh, Sylvester Turner, who actually gave me my first grant of $7,000. This is when he was actually, he wasn't mayor. He was a state senator, I think he was a uh, state senator. He gave me, and he's come back a couple of times to uh, check on and see everything, how everything's going. But he gave me the, uh, my uh, initial start uh, to be able to start uh, this whole project. So my thanks are to him also for uh, seeing the, uh, the beauty of it. So anyway, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Any questions for Dr. Kelly? This is an interesting project because it, the, 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 the jail, the center, is literally two blocks away. And you go in, and it is a completely different environment from anything you've ever seen, right here, right, right next door. And you do. You go in. You go in with a. You go in not knowing what to expect, and you come out with a real appreciation of the misdeeds of somebody for various reasons. They end up in this environment that is just, just difficult. Difficult for them. Difficult for their families. And yet you have Dr. Kelly and his students going in and n not only giving them a skill, but, but encouraging them and, and giving them hope because other people are coming in to invest in them when they don't have to. It's not a pretty picture. Yes, ma'am. I just would like to thank you for the work that you do. My son is a criminal judge in Houston and he told me when he first got there, he said, Mom, we need so much help with these young people. First of all, 85% of them are minorities without money. And they wouldn't even be in holding if they had money because they could pay their bail. You know, and I, it's something I never really thought about, the bail system, that it's unfair or 
it makes me sad mm -hmm. to think about the things that I didn't think about. But with him in the position he is and to know that people like you are helping. And another thing is that he used the word encouraging. And my son told me that um, ordinarily if you don't show up on time, if you are on bail even, if you don't show up on time for court, they just put a, a warrant out for your arrest. So in his court, he decided that he was going to give some leniency, and he gives a two-week window. And he just says, come any time in these two weeks. You may have to sit and wait, but I'll talk to you. You know, I'll talk to you. And he talks to them, and he talks to them about getting their life on track and everything. And anyway, it just sounds like you're in alignment with those, those goals that he has to, to, has to help these people with life goals because it, they, they feel neglected and put upon and pushed in the corner and not, not valued at all. And I think that every little bit of encouragement we can give them, it helps them to, to have some self-efficacy and some self-esteem and to know that they are valued because everybody should be valued. And Dr. Kelly's project is a, another example of hands-on learning that we do in this college all the time. Like Dr. Buckler was saying where the light bulb went on for his student. His, the, God, Dr. Kelly's students are, are literally working and as they're applying their skill, they're, be, they're beginning to see the effect of what they're doing. Not just in book learning, but in actuality, sir. Um, so I also commend you for the work that you're doing. Um, I am a former nurse at JDC. I used to work for Moa Kanji in that unit. Um, and often what I saw was the children um, reporting that they felt so cared for um, because at home their environments were so awful. Um, and we saw a lot of repeat offenders and they would come back through but they knew they had a place to sleep. They knew they were gonna have a meal. They knew that they were going to have support that maybe they weren't getting on the outside. Um, and I worked specifically on floors one through four, so with some of the younger populations, not the older ones. Um, but often what I saw was that when they would return to their environments, they would excel in school in the, while incar incarcerated, but when they were released, they would go back to these environments that weren't necessarily conducive to, like, their education. So my question for you is, um, do you know of any community services that are providing um, a continuity of care for these children so that when they go back to their home environments, they have some type of support that encourages their literacy and educational goals? Yes. There are other, pro there, I'm sorry, there are programs um, that occur outside of school. We're the only project that's allowed to actually go in during school because they have to teach the four core subjects. All children in Texas have to be educated no matter where they are, whether they're in a hospital or any place else or, the, or juvenile detention center. So, they, um, so we, there's organizations that go in and recruit you know, the kids when they're going, so that when they come out, they'll have a place to go. So yes, there are a number of organizations who are there to support them when they leave. The juvenile system also has uh, their own system where they have individuals who go into the home and uh, make sure that they're, they're getting the services that they need or were prescribed by the judges. The judges are very, I'm not going to say liberal, the judges want the children to go home. They don't want them in jail. That's not the purpose. But uh, the reality is that some of the, 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 um, the, the things that they do are so egregious that they can't go home, and others that their parents won't take them home, like I said. One of the things I want to talk about just, just briefly is my students. They're the key to everything, to, to the success of the program, plus the book. The, the, te the book that we use is, is also. But my students, even though uh, they, they, you know, most of my students now are 18 to 20 years old. I mean, they have to be 21 to go in there, but they're they're young. They're they're closer in age to these students than I am. So they're uh, and when my students are working with them, they get to talking with them. And when they f find out that they're not doing this for money, or they're not being used, this is a big this is big with those those kids um, because when they're in the free, as they call it, in the free. Uh, they're they're used and abused, and everyone's you know, you know has their hand out wanting to, to take their money. 
So it's, um, but my students are the key to the success, uh, and that's the reason why we keep going in, and that's the reason why they keep inviting us in, and they want as many as we possibly can get. So that, so it's, um, but yes, there are organizations that are out there. In fact, I did have student, uh, there's or, uh, organizations that I'm in contact with that I, uh, my students who are not old enough, they can volunteer with this group and they can, they can work with the incarcerated youth once they go home. So, yeah, anyway. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Thank you. So next we're gonna go to Dr. Gehring here. And before Dr. Gehring talks, one of the things I love about what she's doing is it, it's another example of making learning real. By, by, by the product that she's creating. Uh, and this, I notice also this whole, ev almost every, if not every single person on here is talking about a creative process. Learning is a creative process. You, you, you think about it, you change it, you adapt it, you create something new. And that's what Dr. Gehring has done with her books. She's made it accessible to, to, uh, to people who might find the textbook learning of criminal justice just too, too textbooky. Too, too complicated. She's brought it to life, Dr. Gehring. Wow, thank you. Um, don't clap yet, no, I'm kidding. Um, I was sitting here thinking about all of the, you know, we have a Curricular Innovation Award, Curriculum Innovation Award, and a Scholarly Innovation Award. And um, so as faculty members, we're given sort of finite funds. We're given a certain number of funds to do travel, and sometimes when you go to one conference, you blow all that money in one conference, especially if you're going to San Francisco <laughs> with the travel and the hotel and the food and everything like that. So a lot of times there are other conferences that we want to go to and we're not able to do that because all of the department travel funds are gone. In addition to that, we have university funds that we can apply for, but it only comes once a year. So if that deadline has passed, and then I find out about another conference or something to go to or faculty development to do, I, the, the deadline has passed. So Dr. Van Horn and Dean Van Horn in creating these um, in, internal awards has allowed a lot of us to further our professional development go to conferences in places where we weren't, wouldn't necessarily be able to do so because we don't have the funding. And I was thinking last year in January, um, I went to Santa Clara to a conference. It was the adult and, fe no, it was the adult and juvenile female offender conference that happens every other year. So that was a special one to go to. And that was a scholarly innovation award. And then in June, I wrote a big curricular innovation award for myself and four other faculty members, so that five other faculty members, so that we could all go to the teaching professor conference, which was in Atlanta. And that was maybe the third time I had gone to that conference, and it was awesome. Um, and then I wrote another scholarly innovation award um, so that I could go to the New York Book Show in October because my graphic novels, my comics, called Crim Comics, um, were nominated in the college book series, and when my co-author and I got there, we learned that we got first place. So that was really awesome to be like, ah, you know, so... So this, thank you. So this uh, teaching professor conference that I've gone to, like, I... Before I started going to these conferences, I thought that I was a good teacher. You know, students liked me, put on a good show, but I realized that I may have really great presentation skills, but I may not necessarily know how to teach well. Because a lot of us, not the educators here, the ones in urban ed, but those of us in criminal justice or social work or any other departments, when we go through our doctoral programs, they teach us the content, but they don't teach us how to teach the content. So I'm sitting at this conference like, I don't know anything about teaching. I don't know about active learning. I don't know about, you know, all of this sort of stuff. And I've gone to this conference and I've learned over and over again new and amazing things that I've now started to incorporate into my class. And one of the things that I learned about when I went to this concert, a concert, when I went to this conference was gamification. So has anyone heard of gamification? You've heard of gamification? So how many of, here, how many of you here play video games? 
So you've heard of you've heard of gamification. Basically, and I've got PowerPoints because I'm a teacher. Okay, so <laughs> well, I'm trying to be a teacher. So um, gamification is basically using game design elements and game principles in non-game contexts. So we do a lot of gamification, whether it's frequent flyer miles or you get some badge when you do something or you get points or you level up, all of those sorts of things. And I wanted to take these concepts into um, the classroom. You know, we can use this for learning, crowdsourcing, recruitment, exercise. Does anybody have an app where if you exercise, you get points or badges or something like that? That's gamification. So I thought, wow, this is a really cool concept to use in class because I know a lot of times as students, we may think as instructors like, well, you should want the grade. Like that should be a motivator for you, right? But that's the, at the end of the semester, nobody's really thinking about it till the end of the semester. These are things that I was trying to use to get students engaged and motivated and they would be sort of instant gratification and it would make the class fun. So when I gamified this course, like I said, I learned about this at the teaching professor conference. I started working on this course and the course was popular culture, crime and justice. So in this class, we talked about, we were gonna talk about crime films, crime television, crime comics, uh, crime video games, crime podcasts, because I've been listening to a lot of true crime podcasts. Um, so, you know, this was something that I wanted to talk about in the class and I was gonna gamify the material. So I taught this class last fall at the Northwest campus. And um, it took a long time for me to sort of figure out, I took a gamification class on Coursera. I read a lot of books. And I sort of developed this, um, and one of the things that was in my syllabus, I said, this class is designed as a video game, and you are the players, instead of your students. Like, it gave them agency, and they were responsible for their own learning. And I sort of reconfigured things and saying, you're going to be, you've just been promoted into a homicide detective and you're soon going to have to solve a crime. So the first couple weeks, we're gonna get sort of acclimated and figure out this class. And the third week I gave them their case. Something happened. And they're gonna have to sort of follow this story and gather clues throughout the rest of the course. Now, when they would do assignments, um, they had to solve puzzles, which were definite, were, were abs that were quizzes. They had to do reflection journals, which I called them interrogations. And they had to gather evidence, which was assignments. And for every assignment, they wouldn't get a grade. They would accumulate experience points, or XP. And when you would get a certain amount of XP, you would level up. And there were 15 levels in this class. And level zero that they all started out with was Scrappy-Doo. Do you all know who Scrappy-Doo is? It's like, yeah, you're like, oh, God, yeah. So if you all don't know who Scrappy-Doo is, you know, we're all groaning. Um, level 15 was Batman. He's like the world's greatest detective. So people try to level up and um, do these things throughout the semester. They could also earn various badges throughout the semester by completing assignments or doing certain activities. And then at the end of the semester, they had a big boss fight. And the boss fight was against me because I was the game master. So they had to create a game and play against me, and that was their final exam. And I cannot tell you the creativity that these students had. Whenever there was a, and what I did is I gave them choices. You can do, you know, this week you could do this assignment, this assignment, or this assignment. You could do all of them. You could do none of them. But you know what, how many points you need to pass this class. If you want to just not do anything this week and then do everything next week or vice versa, you're responsible for accumulating the points that you need to get in order to pass. So the funds for this time around that I got from the Curriculum Innovation Award is I purchased five different colors of these full page label paper to make badges. So I would print out 
um, badges. I would use word art in Word, and I'd make all these badges and print them out. I mean, my wife was like, what are you doing? And you're like, I'm in there for hours, like, oh, I like this shape, and where, what, I need to find this icon, and, you know, this font. I mean, it was like, it was really fun. And then I purchased Field Notes notebooks to keep the badges in, because since they were labels, they'd peel them off and stick them in. And then I also um, bought tickets to the Houston Museum of Natural Science to see the Sherlock Holmes International Exhibition because I have the students read um, Sherlock Holmes, um, one of the stories, and I had gone to this exhibition and I loved it and I was like, oh my God, my students are going to love it. So um, this was basically, it was supplies for this class and it, it really led to, um, you know, high impact learning. I have some pictures here. So this is what they would get like the first day um, this is a student, he's gotten some badges and he's like putting it in his little book and here's some badges like, this was Dexter, you know, if you've seen Dexter, you could be a Dexter level. Um, if they got creative, they got like a Picasso badge. Um, this is like if he did every, if they did everything all the whole week, this is like weekly whiz. I actually had a class in my friendly neighborhood comic book store down the street. So this is the eighth dimension badge for all the people that like went to that class that day. So um, that was really fun. And then this is the, this was the third week where they were given like, this is the case and you have to solve it all the way through the class period. And then here are some other badges too. So if they got a certain amount of points in a module, like the comics module or the fiction module, they would get a different type of um, badge as well. And then this is when we went, you can't really see it. We went to um, the museum and they loved this museum. It was like very hands-on. One of my students had never been to a museum before, like ever. So because we had, um, I had bought the tickets, she was able to go and like look at the dinosaurs and see all the stuff there and she had never been there ever. So I was really happy about that. So. This is them, you know, getting all hands on in the exhibit. And then here's some more exhibits where, you know, they're having to look at the tracks of like the legs being drug on the sand, you know, that kind of stuff. And they had to solve a crime like in this area. So it was really amazing. They had a really great time. And honestly, I cannot remember the last time that I had so much fun and I was so excited to develop a class, not, not necessarily teach it, because that was awesome and exciting and everything, but to actually develop it and feel like I was being creative and it was so much fun for me. So um, I'm teaching it again this fall and I'm teaching it here. So um, I have a lot of ideas. There's a lot of things I've learned from this class that I'm gonna incorporate into the class in the fall. So I'm just really excited and really thankful that you know, I had the funds to sort of do this. So unless there are any questions for Dr. Gehring, since we are running out of time, I'm gonna go straight to our Professor Gilmore. Dr. Gilmore? Uh, Sorry, okay. Dr. Gilmore. Beth, Beth Dr. Gilmore. Okay. okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Beth Gilmore, and I am a lecturer in the Department of uh, Criminal Justice and Social Work, and I teach um, on the criminal justice side. So um, this evening, uh, briefly, I'm going to talk about two different awards um, that I received um, this, this last year. Um, and I know that this has been uh, repeated several times, but it's a, it's a concept that bears uh, repeating. So um, in the spring of 2017, I was a very new faculty member, and I found out that uh, we had a course in our department called Criminal Investigations. And I read the course description, and it said, essentially, that this was a crime scene course. It was a physical evidence course. And I said, my goodness, I, I used to work crime scenes. I have a bunch of years working as a criminalist for a sheriff's office. I want to teach this class. And it was much to the surprise of the current department chair because she said, well, we've never had a full-time faculty member teach this class, and we've never had a female teach this class, so are you sure you want this class? I mean, this is kind of a weird class. And I said, yeah, no, I really want this class. And so 
I was really excited and I started teaching the class and um, I realized when I was preparing for the course, I said, you know, I don't really think you can teach a crime scene class unless you do some hands-on activities in the class. You have to teach students, like you can't just show students a video of fingerprint development. You have to teach them with black powder and brushes how to develop fingerprints. And so um, I scurried onto the website at the university level and I said, I'm gonna put in for some sort of award or funding. And much to my surprise, um, I was ineligible for all funding opportunities because um, I hold the title of lecturer and um, lecturers, as uh, Professor Savani said, um, we're ineligible. And so um, I remember being quite dumbfounded. <laughs> and so um, I was talking with Dean Van Horn and I said, Dean, do um, you think there's any way you could come up with some money from me, for me? I really need some money. I need, uh, I need to be able to do some fingerprinting. And uh, she said, sure, we'll figure something out. And, uh, and she did. And, um, and since that time, I've put in for this award multiple, on multiple occasions um, for my, my criminal investigations classes and, and a few others. And I've really developed um, the course out. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of those things very briefly and some of the things that I've done. But it's so uh, rewarding um, to work in this college and to know that the work that you do is valued by, by leadership and to know that you can put in for funding and you're going to have support. Um, it's, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. And I mean, in, in terms of just the individuals sitting up here, ne nearly half of us wouldn't be here. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be here if this was some sort of a university-driven funding initiative. We wouldn't be able to put in for these things. We wouldn't be eligible. So, um, so thank you, Dean. Uh, we, we do appreciate you, um, and, and, and it certainly doesn't go um, unnoticed. We, we appreciate you. So, um, so, anyway, so let's get back to some of the stuff that, that I purchased. So, um, so the first semester out, I purchased um, some, some fingerprint brushes, some black powder, some fingerprint tape, uh, some very basic things. Um, the following semester, I was able to put in for some magnetic powder. Um, I was able to put in for um, different ink rolling kits. Um, my students now not only use black powder to dust on different surfaces, they also use fluorescent powders, magnetic powders. They are rolling fingerprints in the classroom. That's a completely different uh, concept. I want them to know how to roll and obtain fingerprints. You never know when the fingerprint that you are rolling of someone um, might be the last set of prints that are ever taken, or the only set. So we need high quality prints um, printed with precision. They also learn how to classify those fingerprints. Um, we've been able to purchase a camera, so our students learn how to photograph, and we're moving into some alternate light source sourcing um, next semester. Uh, the students also get to do presumptive blood testing. Um, and so they get to do a ton of stuff. And um, one of the great things is that uh, slowly but surely, I've managed to really build up this class to hit a lot of different physical evidence uh, collection components. And so um, between the different courses that I teach that have these hands-on uh, elements, so it's not just criminal investigations, um, I teach a course in uh, death investigations, and I also teach a course in child abuse and neglect. Um, I have about 250 students, give or take a few, uh, that have had the opportunity to utilize uh, these materials. So that's a lot in a very short period of time. And um, I think that these skills are so important. You know, they're cool and they're fun, um, but they're also just so important. And I can't tell you the amount of current police officers. So we have a, a lot of police officers in our program, right? They're, they're currently working as officers and they're coming here to complete their bachelor's degree that have come up to me and said, you've really made me a lot better at doing this. I'm really grateful that you've helped me through this because you know, police officers have to do so much in the academy, right? They have to learn how to, con how to drive, how to shoot, how to conduct traffic stops, um, you know, law, penal code, all these things, right? So even if they're being taught this, certainly um, they're not getting, you know, this hands-on as much as we're doing in the classroom. So, um, so I think that that's really great, um, and I, I look forward every semester to building it out even more. I've even had um, an honors uh, project. I had a cohort of students um, in the honors program at our university. They are required to do 
an additional something so they can enroll in my class in criminal investigations and that's their grade for the class, but then they have to do an honors project that counts as their honors grade or honors credit. So I had a group of them come to me and they were from all different parts of the college. I had a business major in there um, and they said, we wanna take criminal investigations and do an honors project with you. Can, can you come up with a project for us? And I said, oh, can I? And so we had a whole crime scene set up. They had to work it in teams and so they worked a crime scene start to finish and um, it was filmed by the honors college and they use it as kind of a recruitment mechanism because it's, kind of, it's cool, right? Um, and we also have a freshman mentee group now. Um, myself and, um, and Dr. Buckler are partnered up and we have a freshman mentee group that is also learning crime scene skills using these materials as well. Um, and they're gonna compete in a competition at a conference. And so that's just, it's, it's just touched so many people and it's, it's awesome. Um, the second award that I wanna speak on um, I'm gonna get emotional, I just know it's gonna happen. Uh, to speak on briefly is I also was awarded a CARES Award um, last year for, for some work that I was doing. Um, I had collected, um, I kind of have worked in a lot of different fields in criminal justice, and I had collected um, qualitative data, meaning I had interviewed people um, who worked in a job that I worked in for years at the medical examiner's office. And these individuals um, respond to death scenes every day, okay? And that's what I did. I worked in the morgue. Some days I would be responding to scenes. Some days I would be in the autopsy suites with the pathologists. So every single day you're responding to death. And I realized that there was this gap in research that no one really studies. We study trauma for first responders, but we look at firefighters and police who actually see those types of incidents rather infrequently, right? But these individuals, every single day, when they get a phone call, um, they're going to a scene involving death, right? And so I had done some qualitative uh, data collection, and um, I realized that um, right in front of my face, I had someone who uh, could be very valuable um, as a part of this uh, project. He's, he's here. Richard, can you give like an arm wave? Arm wave, that's Richard. Uh, so <laughs> Richard uh, was one of my students at the time. Um, he's, he's no longer in the uh, bachelor's uh, program, he's in the master's program. Um, but he was in the bachelor's program at the time and I realized that Richard um, was a, a, a wealth of information from, he's a sergeant over in a Pasadena police with um, 20 plus years of experience. And so um, I said, hey Richard, would you like to be a part of this project? And, um, and he said yes. And I was very fortunate to have him and his expertise um, come on board. And so uh, Richard helped me and helped me with data collection, uh, coding and analysis. and. You know, I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about the, the project and the research because that's not, that's not what the CARES Award is for me. What the CARES Award is, is that it affords this opportunity for someone like Richard, who had never been to an academic conference, who had never presented scholarship or anything like that, the opportunity to attend. Um, he went to ASC, which is a very highly regarded um, conference within um, criminal justice, and he presented on a panel. I, I didn't do that until my last semester in a doctoral program, and um, and he did it as an undergraduate, um, and and better, much better than I did at the doc level. And so, um, it's this really unique and dynamic experience, and um, and it was really neat to experience that with him to. Um, to see him, you know, looking through the program and picking out things that he was interested in, and really getting to see um, all scholar, all different scholars, you know, recognizing well, that that person is a theorist and writes in textbooks, and I, I know that name there, and that was just really neat. Um, and so, and and what's great is that you know Richard's now a master's student. He's already come to me with another project idea, all on his own. Um, that he's going to, he already has begun. Um, and so, it's it's a real, it's a catalyst for learning. It's a catalyst for um, contributing to, to to scholarship. And so, um, so I'm really happy that um, Richard was afforded that 
opportunity to really shine. I mean, he really did. He he took it on as as his own, and I was um, I was thrilled to be a part of that that growth um, that growth and development. So um, so these awards are are just amazing and I feel like they're one of those things that they just happen and then you know great things come of them and, and certainly Richard is um, is is proof of that so uh, so those are the awards that I got um, and uh, and thank you for listening <laughs> or just that Thank you, Dr. Beth Gilmore. Okay, so um, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Beth? <laughs> <laughs> give you a new moniker there. Any, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, besides the fingerprints, are you gonna do, are you gonna teach your students something else? Oh yeah. So they um, they do. So right now in my course. Um, and this is, now I've gotten funding ag again. Um, and so, uh, so right now, here's what they do. They do what I call investigative practicums. And so they have to do um, five. The first one is that they have to learn how to correctly establish a crime scene perimeter. So that's their first one. Uh, their second one is that they have to dust for latent fingerprints using black powder and a fiberglass brush on four surfaces. So they do that. And they have to collect them, lift them um, from those surfaces. Uh, the next one is that they have to roll fingerprints using two different types of ink and classify those prints. Uh, the next one after that is presumptive blood testing. So they have to presumptively test correctly um, for the presence or, or non-presence of blood in a field setting. Um, and then the very last one involves photography, depth of field, and um, overall mid-range and close-up photography. So that's right now. And then uh, we're incorporating some alternative light sources for, for next semester. So five right now. So it's really exciting. So it started off with fingerprinting, but it's gone forward. You can take my class. You can take my class. <laughs> yeah, the dean caught me in the elevator. Like I had gloves on, and I was like dressed in almost like a tarp with a bowl of. Um, it was a. It's a biological a material that acts like blood, so it wasn't real blood. But it, you know, just you're walking off the elevator, and I'm like, nothing to see here, dean. <laughs> she just kept walking. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I just want to say you had just made me want to transform my classroom oh, to gaming. Okay. <laughs> One of my big goals this year is, um, and actually is going to continue to next year, is engaging my students. I work with kinder, so you can imagine. So your ideas, everything you just spoke of, has made me realize all the things that I have to do over the summer to make it better for my kindergartens next year. Email me, and I'll send you like a list of books and yes. things that you can... So you have inspired me. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Oh, you made my day. Thanks. Anybody else? Yes. I also volunteer as tribute to transform, cla transform classrooms when I get into the classroom, please. And thank you. Uh, is it Gilmore? Gilmore? That's that's your that's your name, right? Okay. Uh, your class is awesome. I definitely want to take it and uh, recommend it. Um, but my question is for Dr. Kelly. Um, so I work at a school. Oh yeah. So I work at a school, and uh, my eighth graders. We are how can I put it? I work in a uh, school where that has a lot of issues. Um, a lot of my students they have issues at home. Um, as well as things that go on throughout the day. Uh, I have some students, one of my students actually before the STAR test, he was actually in jail um, for, he robbed somebody with a gun and he somehow got bail and whatnot and he was at my school to take his STAR test. Awesome, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, but like, but the thing is um, we try to talk to our kids as much as we can and do everything we can for them. So I guess my question is how can we preach education to them and let them know they can escape where they come from when maybe not maybe their parents I'm not gonna say aren't doing their jobs or like when they you know they have issues at home and things like that as well as the things that they see these kids may not have may not can read may not can have books but they have a cell phone to watch videos and things like that that are crazy so how can we get them to understand that there's a better way out than the streets uh, just being there with them. Oh, 
Sorry about that. I keep forgetting that. Um, the fact that you are there and, um, and you're actually giving them, you're inspiring them. You may be the only person that they've ever known that's ever gone, that's in college or ever gone to college. That's what we are finding is that uh, the, a lot of our, the, these students uh, that are, and he, he alluded to it, is there a recidivism is because it's actually not a bad place for them to be. It, that they're, uh, they have, they're protected, they get medical care, they get psych care, they get drugs that they, there's a lot of these 50%, they, uh, we estimate about 50% ha are, have uh, uh, disabilities. But the fact that you're part of that, and so you can introduce them to books and introduce them to the power of reading and, and things like that, and things that are of interest to them. Talk to them about, um, there's a lot of good graphic novels out there that seems to be resonate with these kids because it, um, uh, a lot of them are, are really scared about reading, but what, 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 because of graphic novels, you, you might go 40 pages and it's all pictures, and you build the story, and, but uh, find books that, uh, that they, wanna, they, they would like to read. And, uh, and does the fact that you're showing interest in them is, more, is huge, and uh, you're doing a great job. Uh, I thank, uh, thank you for your, you know, your service because that's, uh, that's what these kids need. They need kids that are close in age to them and know that they're not doing, they don't, they're not getting paid for this. They're, that's one of the biggest things that they are shocked at, uh, the, that my kids are, are there, that um, they're not in it for anything but learning how to teach and, and, and all that. And the other thing is, one of the other reasons, like you just talked about, one of the other things is, is that my teachers, and I stress this upon them, is that, our future teachers, I should say, is that these kids are going to be in your classroom before they commit a crime, during, uh, while, while they're incarcerated, and when they come back out, they're going to be back in your classroom. So that's the reason why they're there, is to learn how to deal with individuals like you're talking about. And um, So take my class. That'll be great. You know? I will this summer, so <laughs> I'll see you then. Yeah. I'm recruiting, so everybody wants to <laughs> And one time someone told me, don't give up. Don't ever give up. Just the fact that you come every day and you're there for them gives them a great sense of hope, I think. I listened to everybody tonight, and I took some words out of things that you said, so I made you a poem. And while Mr. Villano gives you your, uh, your, your gift to remember tonight, I'm going to read you your poem. It's called a found poem because it means that I didn't write the words. I found the words in the things that they said and that you said. Continuing to partner, increasing knowledge in our university. Dream the possible, experience what it can be. Make sense of what you're doing. Work on something together, learning new things. What is at issue? This is a huge problem. Come in contact with a social worker. You can read and write about it all day long, but until you're with them, until you're with someone, you don't really know. This is a non-traditional educational setting, an important piece of the learning process. I'm trying to be a teacher. Level up, gamify, you have to teach them, develop, Roll and obtain high quality. You make me a lot better. Thank you. You. You make all of us a lot better, and, they, and we are doing it together. Thank you. Thank, oh. Hi. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say something real quick. Um, I started at UHD in 2015, and one of the first questions that I asked a faculty member, actually several faculty members, we have this center in the college, what is it? And the answer was always, we're not really sure. And I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt in 2019, I can tell you what the center is about, uh, largely because of the work of Dean Van Horn and Steve Villano. Um, when Steve was added to the staff, things really just turned around, and I can tell you now what this center is, and it is awesome. Good work, guys. <laughs>